Okay, so let's, let's now move to NVP, the first production quality network virtualization plot platform. The context and motivation for NVP was a bit different from Flowvisor. So it started like, as I started in the beginning of this, of this lecture, uh, with the problem that uh, we know that uh, server virtualization has become the dominant approach for managing computational infrastructures. Uh, that's cloud computing, enabled cloud computing. And, and what is lacking to achieve full virtualization, of course, virtualizing the network. That's why this is the topic that we're discussing today. Um, so the question is, what network aspects are important to virtualize? Network topology, we've seen that Flowvisor achieves sort of network topology, uh, but the goal is that different workloads require different topologies. Uh, traditionally, this problem ha is solved like simply by building multiple physical networks, which is not good. Of course, uh, Flowvisor has started uh, offering some, some solution, but it's not as ideal as, as this MVP. And, and, and also, uh, uh, the other thing that's important to virtualize is the address space. So, and this is something that Flowvisor doesn't do. So, uh, the virtualized workloads have to operate in the same address space as the physical network. Uh, what that means is like, if you have, you know, if you're using uh, addresses 10.x, then uh, for your physical network, you have to use the same for the virtual network. So you don't have that decoupling that I mentioned at the beginning between the virtual and the physical worlds. So the problem is that you cannot move VMs to arbitrary locations because they have different IP addresses. So you have to change the IP address. It's not transparent because you'd have to change the configuration of virtual machines. Uh, you cannot change the addressing type. It's like if you have the network with IPv4, then v VMs have to be IPv4. And this is obviously, this is a problem. It doesn't really offer full network virtualization. Um, so yes, it's true that we've had network virtualization for ages, but as I said, primitives like VLANs that virtualize L2 Ethernet networks or broadcast domains, uh, net boxes that virtualize the IP address space, so they allow you to have in your private network, um, you know, uh, any IP address that you want, and then when 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 the packets go uh, traverse the net and go to the internet, then they will have a public IP address, which obviously cannot be shared by anyone. Uh, so it has limitations, not full virtualization. Uh, and it's only virtualizing the address space. It's only a particular thing. And MPLS allows you to virtualize physical paths to those that don't recall or to those that never heard of MPLS. If you recall, uh, IP routing um, uh, works by the path to a destination is determined by the destination address alone. So if you have this situation here where uh, the, these routers R6 and R5 are, 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 are sending packets towards uh, A, uh, they will have to follow that same route, uh, that same path, uh, because, because it's destination based. With MPLS, you can uh, you have more flexibility. So, for example, you can use both source and destination addresses to make decisions on routing, and you could, for example, um, make packets that that f that come from source R6 uh, use a different path from pa paths that come from R5. So this this allows virtualization of physical paths, but only of physical paths, nothing else. So these three things are primitives that one could use to offer uh, a global a full network virtualization, but it still wouldn't be enough, okay? The main problem of these solutions is that, for example, VLANs and even the others, they don't scale well. Um, more importantly, they're all point solutions. They require box-by-box -box configuration, uh, so, so they don't offer, offer global unifying abstractions, and in one word, they do not fully decouple the virtual network from the physical network or the substrate network. NVP changes this. It's a, it's a complete network virtualization solution that allows the creation of virtual networks, each with independent addresses. So you can use whatever IP address or Ethernet address that you want. You can define your topology. You can build your virtual topology the way you want. And you can use any service model. So you can use your VLANs or other types of services uh, uh, independently from any other tenant all over the same substrate or physical network. <coughs> So, network, uh, so the network hypervisor proposed in NVP offers two abstractions. One is the control abstraction, uh, which is basically you let your tenants define the logical data paths that are configured 
uh, with their control plane. So for example, in this figure here, you have a, a tenant that, de that decides, okay, so I want one switch, a layer two switch, I want a layer three router, and I want another layer two switch. So this is my network. I have like this control plane is basically the, the algorithms that, that make this uh, learning switch work. So that's a learning switch algorithm. This could be like a sort of a uh, Dijkstra-based algorithm, like uh, OSPS, OSPF-based algorithm for for the for the IP router, and you would have in here another learning switch, another Ethernet learning switch here. So basically, the, the tenants can define these logical data paths. So these are only logical, and they can configure their data paths uh, at will, right? Uh, insert the, f the the flow rules that they want in their virtual in their virtual uh, uh, switches or their virtual network nodes to build a logical data path. So this is a logical data path, which is basically, uh, we can also call it a logical network. So it's just a set of logical uh, network elements. How are these defined? So basically they are defined as a, a pipeline of tables, right? Uh, so you have uh, all of these things as we've learned in this course, all of these uh, boxes, all of all network green boxes, what they are is that they, 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 they match in table you have a match action in a table, and so uh, and so. How is these logical data paths are really defined as a pipeline of these tables, okay? And the pipeline results in a forwarding decision. How are they implemented? In software, okay? So they are implemented in in, in the virtual switches that run in the hypervisor of uh, you know of, of of a server. So you have a server that allows you to have in the compute hypervisor. I mean. A server is running a software switch. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, a compute hypervisor like Xen, for example, runs a software switch, which can be open vSwitch, which is the, the most common one. And, and all the logical data paths are implemented in the end hosts. Okay, So they are implemented in these hypervisors. So they are, this is an edge-based solution. Everything is done at the edge. Okay, uh, What's the advantage over? A, so a solution implemented in hardware, so in, in real hardware switches, ASIC switches. Uh, it's more flexible. You can match over arbitrary packet header fields. So basically, you have the flexibility of software. And the second abstraction is the packet abstraction. Um, so basically, the packets that are sent by, by, by the endpoints are given the same treatment in terms of switching, routing, ACL filtering, etc., as in the tenant's home network. Uh, so it's like, you know, it's, it's a complete... Uh, full virtualization. Your packets will experience exactly the same as they would experience in a real network, but everything is done in the in their uh, host switches. Okay, so it's like you can imagine that everything in the, at the edge, at the hypervisor, um, the treatment uh, given to packets is exactly the same as if it were a physical network. But it's everything. Everything is done uh, mostly in at the source, right? At the source hypervisor. Um, the architecture of the network hypervisor, uh, um, you know, consists of basically you have these logical data paths which are translated into physical data paths for the software switch that runs uh, uh, in the hypervisor, in the source hypervisor. Uh, so that's, you know, they use OVS, which is Open V switch here as the physical thing. So you have uh, this is the virtual NIC of the source of the virtual machine. The virtual machine starts sending packets. The packets go through the software switch, which is OVS, and then they are sent towards the network, okay? And they use tunneling, okay? So what happens when the logical data paths reach a forwarding decision? Well, the packet is basically, when the decision is taken, so after the logical data path, there is a decision that is made. The decision can be forward this packet here or drop this packet or whatever. Um, but if you have to forward this packet somewhere, then the packet will be tunneled over the physical network. So you use tunnels uh, to the host hypervisor, to the receiving host to the destination, okay? Um, you can use any encapsulation mechanisms for tunneling. Um, anything that allows basically encapsulating Ethernet frames inside IP packets, for example. So GRE, STT, uh, I will mention briefly these uh, next. Then the host hypervisor here will just decapsulate the packet and send it to the destination virtual machine. And what's interesting is that since everything is tunneled, so the, the physical network sees only ordinary IP traffic. So you don't have to touch the physical network. It's just your physical network that runs IP protocols. 
and 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 you have network virtualization because everything is done at the edge. Everything is done in the hypervisors that run in the servers of your network. So you only have to touch the servers. Okay, so what's tunneling? Just to just to, just to make sure that everybody understands what tunneling is. So you can imagine that you have, for, like for example, tunneling between two private network sites. Like I want to communicate uh, from this computer to this computer, so I can just tunnel over the internet over a public network. So the idea is that you create a, you set up a tunnel between these two routers, which are like the border routers of your network, and and you send the packet. Via this, of course, you cannot send the packet with with source and IP addresses like this, with with source and destination addresses like this, because this uh, this network 10.x doesn't exist really in the public network. It's something that's private to your network. So what you do is that you encapsulate. So you have this, you know, you, usually you need a header for the type of encapsulation that you're doing. For example, in here I'm showing GRE, and then you have a delivery header, which is something that says, okay, so you're you're sending this packet that is tunneled, is tunneled in this tunnel, and the tunnel is between 20, this, this router 20111, and this interface of this router 30111. Okay, so what's the network entity that configures the software switches at the border? Of course, a cluster of SDN controllers. This is a, a, a solution that is entirely SDN based. You have tunnels for that tunnels. But the tunnels work for point-to-point -point communication. They don't work for multicast or broadcast. So for these two types of communication, uh, they use a multicast overlay. They add uh, what they call service nodes that basically replicate the packets received. And um, how are the logical networks interconnected with physical networks? Because then these networks, they have to communicate with the, with the internet, with the world. And they do this simply by using gateways, which is what usually you do. Uh, when you want to communicate with, with the outside world. So the technique is similar, but in this case, it's by communicating between logical networks and, and the internet and, or other physical networks. Um, so in the paper, the authors uh, have, have described, uh, have, have gone into the detail of three design challenges. The first was how to accelerate software switching. This is based on software on switch, uh, software switches, we have a problem that they may be slow, so they have these clever techniques to uh, accelerate software switching. The second design challenge is how to compute all this forwarding state and disseminate it to the switches, avoiding inconsistencies. F finally, how to scale the controller cluster. And these are the three technical challenges that I address in the paper. So let's start with the first. Um, so the logical data path implementation is, uh, as I said, uses open vSwitch to forward packets. Uh, so the, the NVP controller cluster, the SDN controller, uh, configures the OVS remotely. Uh, and they use two protocols, OpenFlow that you know, that inspects and modifies flow tables, um, and also OVSDB. OVSDB is a protocol that is used in parallel and is used to create and manage these tunnels, basically. The overlay tunnels, OpenFlow doesn't allow the, the, the setting up tunnels. So OVSDB is used for this purpose. Also to discover which VMs are hosted at a hypervisor, etc. So OVSDB is more of a configuration protocol, a management protocol, whereas OpenFlow allows you to change the control plane directly, like the flow tables. The logical pipeline is created by, uh, by a clever technique that is basically you augment your logical flow table in OVS to include a match over also packets metadata. So it's not only the, the data that comes with the packets, you, uh, or, or with the packets headers, but you also in, increase, let's say, augment the, the, the packets header with metadata, something that doesn't go in the packet, but that is perceived, is used by Open vSwitch. Uh, and they use this to, for, for log, uh, to, to insert log, logical table identifiers. And the idea is that NVP will modify each action to write the ID of the next logical flow table. Okay. So the thing is, uh, so in OVS you may have like let's let's imagine that in OVS you only have one flow table, whereas uh, the, the the tenant. Uh, the logical network has many flow tables. So basically they use this trick of adding an ID of the next next logical flow table so that you can use only like one single real flow table to map several logical flow tables. I hope this was clear. 
uh, and this is what creates the logical pipeline. Of course, this is more complex than, than that because in practice, OVS also has multiple flow tables, but you can just think that uh, the easiest way to think about this is that you're virtualizing the flow table. You have one single flow table in Open vSwitch, and then with this packet, 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 packet metadata, uh, you insert these IDs so that you can basically match several times in the same flow table. Let me return here. This is only a simple way to explain this. It's not exactly like this, but I think this will this gives an idea of the, of the concept. Okay. So one problem is forwarding performance. So this is one of the first problems that I mentioned before. Uh, you know, because traditional physical switches they classify packets using TCAMs and they're very fast, so so they can achieve gigabits of speed, like 10 gigabits per second. And in software switching, you cannot really do that. So you cannot do that in in your uh, with software switches. However, they use uh, several techniques. They explore several techniques that allow them to have the same behavior as physical switches, which is very cool. They use, first of all, flow caching, which exploits traffic locality. So the idea is that all packets that belong to the same flow, say to, uh, to one TCP connection, they traverse exactly the same set of flow entries. But this means is that the first packet of the flow will be sent from the kernel module to user space. It's like the first packet in, uh, uh, that is uh, that is that arrives at, at, at that kernel, at that, at that so software switch. But then the user space installs exact match flows into the kernel. So future packets don't leave the kernel. This is, you know, this, this allows the fact that you don't have to cross uh, from kernel to user space, uh, you know, increases uh, throughput significantly. And, and most importantly, they use hardware offloading techniques. Uh, such as TCP segment offloading and large receive offload. So this is basically this allow these are techniques that al that allow the OS to, s to to offload some work to the network interface card to the NICs. Okay, so the, the operating system uh, is allowed to send TCP packets that are larger than the physical MCU, uh, and then the NIC will take care of the rest. Okay, so so basically the you're basically saving the CPU from work and shifting uh, work to the NIC. And this way, you can increase the throughputs uh, of, that you have in your network. There is a problem, however, is that we are in a virtualized setting, and the cur current, the you know, the physical Ethernet NICs, they don't support offloading in the presence of encapsulation because you have tunnels here. So the solution was to use a new, uh, a more recent uh, technique called TSS as encapsulation method, and the idea uh, method, and the idea is to add a fake TCP header. And then the NIC is, is capable of performing this. Uh, so you know you're you're, you're basically uh, lying to the NIC, and he'll do what you want. Okay. The second uh, challenge was uh, forwarding state computation, uh, because forwarding state um, is computed based on the on the location of every virtual NIC of the system configuration, and then it's pushed uh, to the transport nodes via using OpenFlow, as I said. Uh, the computational model used by NVP is in entirely proactive. This is different from the traditional SDN model that we've seen, uh, where the first packet of a flow usually goes to the controller. In this case, there is no packet that goes to the controller. The controllers push all forwarding state down. They never process any packet. Okay. Um, so the main reason why uh, they use this is that it, it simplifies the scaling of the controller cluster because they will never receive packets from the data plane, so this allows simplified scaling and also allows uh, helps in failure isolation. Um, there is a problem, th and that's, that's a problem that is solved with the introduction of a new programming language. So basically, if they would have to compute everything from the, an entire data center, every time there is a change, that would be very inefficient, so they perform incremental computation, which is very hard to code and to test, and so they've developed a, a, a domain-specific language, uh, NLOG, uh, a of the declarative type, that basically facilitates uh, the implementation by separating uh, the specification of the logic from the implementation. Finally, third challenge. Uh, what techniques are used to scale computation? So basically, they divide uh, the controllers into a two-layer uh, hierarchy uh, between physical controllers and, and logical controllers. And by separating concerns, they, 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 they enable more parallelization. Okay, And that's, that's, that's good to achieve scale. 
and, and to guarantee high availability. They, they, they have hot standbys at both layers, so they, they replicate basically uh, STN controllers. Um, in terms of evaluation, uh, so they've simulated bringing uh, an entire system back online after a major data center disaster. It took around the one hour uh, to, to put everything up, which may be, you know, it may look a lot, but, you know, just restarting completely a data center uh, from scratch in one hour is, I think it's, it's impressive anyway. Um, then another aspect that I think was important was uh, tunnel performance. Um, so what we see here uh, is that th they've compared with no encapsulation and then with encapsulation. And what we see is that uh, the GRE throughput is low. And it's low because it's incapable of using hardware offloading techniques. By using STT, as I explained, uh, STT inserts these fake TCP headers and is capable of having uh, you know, a throughput that's equivalent to no encapsulation. It's basically the same. Uh, a bit more of uh, receiver CPU load, so there's a bit more of work. But anyway, you know, you just increase another CPU in in your in your receiver, and that's that's not a big problem in 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 a, in a data center at least. Uh, but the throughput, you know, is 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 basically the same as without encapsulation, which is, which is an excellent result. Okay, as I would leave the here for discussion, that you would you know discuss with your colleagues uh, if you're uh, watching this video uh, you know uh, with, with with some friends uh, what what are in your opinion the seeds of, of the success of NVP I would leave that uh, you know for you to discuss uh, anyway I'll leave uh, some pointers here one I think is like uh, an interesting thing was that the logical networks they look exactly like current network configurations so uh, you know the, what they say in the paper is that we know that current networks have many flaws but you know they're a large installed base. People know how to use them, and and usually the users want to use the same networks as they are used to. You know, they're, they're used to their physical networks. If they move to the virtual world, they want things to look the same, even if if even if the physical world was not that good. You know, at least we know uh, the bads of it. Let's say. Interestingly, like uh, I have uh, one of the projects that I'm proposing for next year is on programmable virtual networks so it's basically not making logical networks look exactly the same I want the, the users of the future to be able to program their networks and not use just you know the, the protocols that we have today another point that I think was was important for the was the was the analog programming language uh, which really have has eased development uh, and um, and of course, uh, software switching uh, was important because it allowed uh, the amount of flexibility that they needed uh, to build the solution. Uh, certainly, software enables much faster innovation. Uh, of course, it has the problem of uh, performance, but the nice thing is that they've used techniques like off offloading techniques, etc., that allowed their system to have a performance similar. Uh, to hardware-based uh, solutions. So that was very clever from them and very, very good overall. Finally, I think that uh, without centralization of control, it would have been impossible to build NVP. So having this centralized global view was the thing that enabled uh, a full decoupling of the virtual network from the, the, the substrate or the physical network. Okay, and this ends this lecture. I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, um, I hope you've enjoyed it, and if you have questions, then we can discuss using the forum. Bye bye for now.